we're talking um, Wong Kar Wai's in the mood for love and in a, a recent poll for the best film of this century um, you know like a hundred films sort of made the list and in the mood for love came in at number two only beaten by uh, uh, David Lynch's Mulholland Drive and um, I, I think that sort of says something about the the reputation um, the brilliance and just the love that many people have for this film it's um it, it's 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 just terrific and the thing about in the mood for love like david lynch's maholland drive is it's such a cinematic film it's such a film about the cinema going to the cinema watching the film in the cinema and uh, i would strongly uh, encourage you all to come along um, to the screening of this because um it, it just looks uh, absolutely terrific and it's probably not going to be the film that you think it may be and um, for what it's worth ladies and gentlemen um, in the mood for love is my favorite film in this course now uh, what you're looking at is a couple of posters of um, in the mood for love and what you will notice from these posters from the film from a number of um, posters um, of films in the course, a number of films itself, is the predominance on the colour red. And when we're kind of talking about, you know, the Asian aesthetic, the Asian design, the, the Asian style, the Asian look, red seems to dominate. And you might want to think about why red is such a prominent colour. And not only in the marketing for this film, but it's also um, uh, in the film itself. The Wong Kar Wai really favours this kind of red aesthetic that's sort of um, continuing across um, you know, this, this film. And this film is a very sensual film. It's a very romantic film. It's a very beautiful film. And red seems to be some sort of uh, appropriate colour. And as you'll see in both of these posters, it's about um, uh, sort of the distance um, and also the connection between um, these two characters, um, played by um, um, played by these two really kind of popular um, sort of Asian Hong Kong actors, Tony Long and Maggie Chung. And basically, it's it's a, it's it's essentially it's a story about an affair, but it's not it's not a it's not what you expect it to be. Okay, I, I just I just want to put it out right there. And it's a very sad film. It's a very wistful film. It's a very romantic film, um, and it's a very intense film, but not in the way that. Um, most of these kind of affair films, if you want to call it that. Is that even a genre? I don't even know if that's a genre. Um, ah, but we'll get to that in a sec. Okay. Now, uh, the general questions that I'm kind of posing uh, for this film is what makes Asian cinema Asian? And it's a film that you can certainly apply to any of the films in the course. But what is it about this film that makes it Asian? Now, even of a film inside Asia. So uh, Stephen T.A. talks about Asian films being inside Asia and outside Asia. You know, some films are set inside Asia, some films are set outside Asia. Um, what makes a film inside Asia Asian? Now, what's interesting about a film like In the Mood for Love is that it clearly works for Western audiences, right? And it's not sort of a, a blo you know, a, an Asian blockbuster film. It's it very much works at a more independent, critical level, but it really, really does speak um, to Western audiences. Now, there's something universal about what's actually happening on the screen with the story and things like that, but it's also about the way that Wong Kar Wai seems to be playing through particular ideas of Asia and Asianness, Asianness that is digestible very much for um, Western audiences. Now, something about the film 
it's worth discussing is the very nostalgia of this film, of the look, um, of, of the mood of the film um, that, that's very much um, happening uh, across this. Now, um, what is not Asian about Asian cinema? And what is not Asian about In the Mood for Love? Well, I mean, in a way, it's kind of ridiculous because the, the film is Asian, of course, but there is a lot of Western influence happening in this film, and that's worth thinking about, certainly just through the songs that you hear across the film. The songs and the music play a seminal role in creating a mood, an atmosphere, and also a sense of nostalgia. Now, nostalgia being a world that can't be touched anymore, a world that no longer exists. But the problem that these characters have is that they want a world within their world that doesn't exist, that they can't actually they can't actually touch, uh, you know, which in itself is, is kind of very interesting to think about. Um, so to what extent does foreignized Asian cinema contribute to its transnationalization? And what's transnational about the film? Now, a lot of the film, um, like if you're interested in directors like uh, J.P. Melville um, and Goddard and, you know, a number of French directors, um, as much as um, kind of Hollywood directors like uh, Douglas Sirk and people like that, you will see a lot of that influence within this film. And I think that's the thing about Wong Kar Wai. He's, he's not making an Asian film exclusively for Asia. He's actually making an Asian film for um, world cinema. And I think that's why the film works really well. If you sort of go into some detail of the film, you know, you will see that um, the, the the director of photography, the person who shot the film, is actually uh, not Asian. Well, he's actually Australian, um, Christopher Doyle, who was there for most of the shoot, but he had to leave because, uh, yeah, he had another film to go to. All right. How do the changes in time and place give alternating Asian experiences? So how and why is this an Asian film? I asked. And, uh, you know, again, accent and language. There's a number of languages across the film that you will hear um some english some french um as much as you know other asian languages think about that think about the accents what's actually spoken what do you hear as an audience member and what does Wong Kar Wai want you to hear across the film now um just a couple of peter pugsley uh quotes um, what then are requirements for the construction of an aesthetic of Asianness? So we're talking about the aesthetic. We're actually talking about the look, the style, the design of an Asian film. And um, the most obvious of these when dealing with film would be the direct element of the cinematic experience. And again, we're banging on about this thing called the cinematic experience. What is the experience that this film is giving you? I mean, it's giving you... Um, an experience of Asia, but it's also giving you an experience of history, of nostalgia, of you know things that are actually happening on the screen. Um, also, Pugley um, he talks about um, the mechanical reproduction of an image, and I think what's actually happening here is the way that the reproduction of this world. Uh, this nostalgic world corresponds with the individual's interpretation of the reality. And Wong Kar Wai, he, he has this kind of, there's something very dreamy about this film, um, which is, again is kind of interesting why the film is placed often next to a film like David Lynch's Marlon Drive, which is also a very dreamy film. It's, it's about places that existed but don't really exist. It, it's very much tied into this whole idea of you're familiar with the place but you're not familiar with the place. And it sort of gives you this um, um, dream, dreamy kind of response and um, to the film, which is why I think it's the film is in itself is so seductive. And that's the purpose of the film. The, the film wants you to feel the seductiveness um, that the, the, these characters themselves are very much feeling. Uh, one of the key elements of creating an Asian aesthetic is the use of traditional colours itself. 
So what colours? Um, so um, Pugsley says, for the West, predominance of red and gold signifies Asia. So uh, what's going on with that, with Asia? Okay, now, um, very much what's going on here in a film like In the Mood for Love is the, the very sense that we're watching a melodrama. And this is, this film um, sort of flo flows on from a number of other directors um, who make melodramas. But the thing about this film is it's not, there aren't scenes of like, um, you know, the the husband and wife finding out um, really what's going on. Um, so the domestic conflict is forecast for the stories, marital betrayals. So there are marital betrayals going on here, which is all very um, kind of, I don't know, risque, if you know, you know, which prepare the way for impassioned confrontations among central quartet of characters. Now, this is all about actually what's happening with the plot. And the plot is so crucial to the look of the film, right? So the central premise is right for moral um, decadism and theatrical emotion, right? So you've got theatrical emotion, but it's not a film about weeping and screaming and yelling. Everything is very quiet and small and understated, right? And the film is very much about pathos. It's about sadness. It's about admiration um, for these characters, for what's actually happening within the story, right? Um, but... Wong affords this melodramatic material a stylistic and narrative treatment that departs in key respects. So what he does is he starts with the classic Hollywood melodrama and then he shifts into something else, which again gives you, it gives you an Asian experience because it's saying, well, it's like those Western family melodramas, but it's actually not like those Western family melodramas. And part of this is also Wong, you know, Wong as, a, a, as, a, um, as an auteur. Now, Wong largely banishes the spouses, right, the, you know, the other people, um, circumventing melodramatic conflict and exposing the adulteress. So because of that, because he's not interested in the, the kind of getting caught aspect of, you know, the, uh, the affair film, the film becomes more sensual, it becomes quieter, and it becomes about emotional expression because all he's interested in are these two central characters and where they are in the world and how they move through the world. In The Mood for Love, and this is a quote um, from the reading that you had for this week, The Mood for Love never raises its voice because it is not about passion, exp um, it is not about passion expressed but passion concealed. And I think that's, that's kind of the key to the film. It's not about passion expressed, but passion concealed. And how do you actually conceal passion? Well, Wong Kar Wai conceals passion through the aesthetic, through the nostalgia, through the look, through the music. And that's why the film is so effective. Because it's he doesn't ever go for the easy option. It's always the difficult option. But boy, is the payoff satisfactory. Okay. Um, what way does authenticity appear in Asian cinema? Now, this is kind of interesting, right? Because um, a lot of people have sort of discussed um, the individual. So the individual, this is a quote, is, is authentic to the extent that they recognize and accept responsibility for everything they do, right? That is an authentic character in a film, that they accept responsibility for everything they do, right? An inauthentic existence then is evolved when individual freedom is sacrificed to prevailing social mores, eventuating in the loss of the self. So if you don't respond to your own emotion, but, the, but you basically behave in a way that sits within the social mores um, of the world around you, then you kind of lose yourself in that, therefore living an inauthentic existence. Now the question about in the mood for love is, the connection between these two people is very strong. The love and the tenderness between these two people is very strong. But they're in a time when they can't 
openly express that to each other. So the question is, is in the mood for love, are these characters in uh, Chow and Sue, are they actually authentic characters or inauthentic characters? And I want you to really think about that uh, when you watch the film. So the, uh, the inauthentic self, is another quote here, the inauthentic self is moulded by external influences, whether these be circumstances, moral codes, political um, authorities, or whatever, right? So what are the external influences that are affecting these characters? Now, Chow and Su eschew the knowledge that would enable them to gratify authentic desire, right? But they refrain from acting on their mutual desire because of the negative consequences that would befall them as social subjects. So they don't, it's about being part of this world, this community, this close knit world. And if they just acted on their own desires, right, they would actually be outcasts from this world and from this society. So it's actually about their identity and actually trying to do the decent thing rather than just, um, you know, living some sort of hedonistic kind of world where they just sort of fulfill their own desires. But does that make them authentic characters or inauthentic characters? And I think we can have a great um, chat about that in the classes. Now, the Asian experience. So, um, this is a, a great shot of, um, of Tony Long. And um, something that Stephen Teo talks about is experiencing Asia through the faces and the way that faces are filmed and photographed. And um, so at the end he says, um, if we think of experience of Asian films by watching Asian faces and by taking in what they reveal to us, we are directly experiencing a factor that will lead us towards greater appreciation of the films, right? So think about that. The thing about this film is it's so understated, but it asks you as a viewer to actually make sense of what's happening and the film will work for you as much as you're willing to work for the film if that makes sense the film doesn't just give you things it doesn't overstate things it actually will hold a shot on a face and will actually ask you to interpret exactly what's going on now more uh, beyond the portrayal of basic primary emotions and animates instead of the higher emotions, complex and compound affective states. Okay, so we're talking about higher emotions, but we're doing it by the audience actually having to put on um, those emotions onto the characters. The, ca the film itself isn't telling you how to think. And restrained emotional atmosphere heightens the poignancy of the protagonist's suffering, right? So because the characters aren't overstating things, right? what happens is that actually heightens the emotion of um, what's happening, happening in the film, which Stephen Teo talks about as the Asian experience, um, you know, through just the very fact that Wong Kar Wai shoots the faces in a particular way and holds the shot on the faces. For our purposes, then, emotion can be understood as a theorising factor that promotes a wider conception and appreciation of Asian cinema. Emotion is not merely personal or private, but also contains many latent issues of social and national importance, which can form a network of related factor in the theorising Asian cinema. So what he's actually saying is, yes, there's something very universal about what's happening, but the way they respond to the, the social world that they're within is very much part of this world of Hong Kong at this particular time that is being depicted on the screen. Okay. Now, the film is kind of punctuated uh, with international influences, which I've uh, spoken about. Um, and Asian cinema can be similarly inside and outside. Uh, you know, as, as I've said, I've said in the past, you know, there are Asian films inside of Asia and Asian films outside of Asia. Um, to be Asian is to be put in a position of interactivity and connection, to be ready for any contingency of being not just Asia, but inter, pan, and trans Asia. And the thing about this film is although it's very much an Asian film within Asia, it's also very much a film um, within a broader idea of world cinema. And that's happening through 
you know, things that I've discussed, uh, music and, you know, setting and just the general melodrama of the story. And uh, just some final thoughts. Um, the pace of the film, I mean, it's a great, it's, it's a film, it's not a, like a fast film, but it's certainly not a slow or boring film either. And just think about the pace of the film. Think about the whole idea of, you know, Pugsley talks about this, the whole idea of the Asian aesthetic and actually the Asia pace and what you actually expect from an Asian film as far as, um, uh, you know, pace goes. And uh, just a quote here, one final consideration is creation of an Asian aesthetic is the use of pace and representation of speed and time in contemporary films. And, um, you know, just... How does the pace reflect other films that you've seen in the course or reflect broader ideas of what you consider, you know, the Asian experience on the screen? Think of the colours. This film has just such a strong use of colours, primary colours, red and blacks. Um, the sounds and the music being so important and also just the setting, the mise en scene, what you actually see within each shot is so important in capturing this world, this mood, this emotion of these characters. All right, I'm going to leave it there. So In the Mood for Love is um, absolutely an, a, an absolutely outstanding film, in my opinion. I just love it dearly, and I look forward to uh, watching uh, this film with you on the big screen because it is a, a big screen cinema um, smorgasbord of um, great visual and um, audio um, you know highlights it's um it's absolutely terrific and it's it's one car wise great film and um i just i just love this film to bits and i hope to watch it with you on the big screen so with that bye for now